And then it goes on. The next couple of verses says, For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or idol. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. So not only does this situation with Hosea and Gomer reveal the heart of God, the way that God feels about the Israelites, you know, you, you treat me like crap and I'm going to go out and, and pay to, to love you out, out for myself, but it shows it, it's actually mapping out a scenario of what is happening with Israel. This is very soon before the exile. And so that's this first verse, verse 4, is referring to. It says they will live without king or prince, so they're not going to be a nation. Without sacrifice, sacred stones, or ephod. So those are the, uh, the elements of the temple system. So they're, they're going to be apart from their religious roots and without idol. They're not even going to be worshiping idols. They're going to be, they're going to be completely destitute. They're not even going to be a nation which we know happened for the northern part in 722 and for the southern part about a century and a half later, obliterated. They were gone, sent into exile. No more country, no more Israel. And it says, afterward, then the Israelites will return. So we have a regathering. And as, actually, as it turns out, we have two regatherings. We have a national regathering where Israel becomes a nation again, but we also have a spiritual regathering, as we see here says, they will seek the Lord their God and David their king. This is a reference to the Old Testament character of the Messiah, the coming Messiah. And now it says David their king. You may be thinking like, well, David's a guy in the Old Testament. Well, keep in mind, this is in the 700s. David was about 1000 BC. So they're, they're not just really confused here. They're, this is a guy who, who lived centuries ago that they're talking about. So when they say David their king, they're referring to a promise that God made when God went to David and he said, one of your descendants is going to sit on the throne forever and he's going to be the Messiah. And so now, since that's already happened, we, we look back and we say, okay, this is talking about Jesus Christ. So the Israelites will return and they will, they will worship David, their king. They will worship the Messiah. And so you have all these parallels between the story of Hosea and Gomer and what's happening with Israel. So they rebel they worship other gods, that's the prostitution part, and they come back and God, who, you know, Hosea in the story, God buys back the price of their rebellion. That's the role of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus paid the price for, and as it turns out, not just for Israel's rebellion, but for all of us. All human sin, he paid the price for it so that we can be reconciled to God. So this, this is a brief snapshot of kind of the life and calling of Hosea. And it's important that we note that Hosea's experience with Gomer is the context for his message to Israel. It's like his experience is like the frame, and what he says to the people is, is like what's in it. And so you, we really need to understand what he went through, what God called him to, in order to understand what God called him to say, because it's such an integral part of it. All right, so let's look at some lessons from Hosea. Some lessons from the, some from the life of Hosea and some from in his in his writing. One, God desires intimacy with His people. Just think about this. Why marriage? God decided, okay, I'm going to show what it's like for me relating to people, and I'm going to use a human relationship to illustrate my point. Why would He choose marriage of all things? Notice, he, he doesn't say to Hosea, you know, go and find a business partner. He doesn't say, go find a slave. He doesn't say, go find a buddy. Although all those pictures are, might be closer to our perceptions of God, of the things that God might do to represent himself. But that's not what he did. What God chose, what God chose to do to represent himself is to have a marriage relationship to show what his interaction is like with people. It's because God desires intimacy with us. And we see this all over the Bible. We see it mainly in, in this illustration, in the marriage illustration, and also in a parent-child illustration. We get that more in the New Testament. That you know, God, is, God wants to be our father. He's a good father to us. And also in Revelations we have that the church is the bride of Christ. We think about that. God, God values us enough not just to make us want to do right, 
you know, but he, he wants us to be close to him. That's one of the key lessons from Hosea. Another one, a spiritual adultery. You might think that sounds kind of strange. What does adultery have to do with spiritual? Well, Israel was practicing spiritual adultery. Basically, God's stance is that he says, I am God, you should worship me. I created you. I've, I've provided you with everything. And so to turn around and put something else at the center there where, where he deserves to be is like idolatry. It's like, it's like cheating on your spouse. So we think about Israel. Israel bowed down to idols. So we, from our perspective, you know, we're looking back on these ancient people. We're you know, pretty enlightened 21st century folks here. So w- we might be thinking... Okay, what, what's the big deal here? So Israel had one religion, you know, Judaism, and they decided to go for this other religion, worshiping idols, whatever religion it would be, whatever you would call it. So, I mean, what's the big deal? Isn't it more important that they have faith? Isn't it more important that they're, that they're worshiping, that they're trying to center their lives on something? Apparently not. Apparently that's not God's stance. He, he is very upset that they're worshiping idols. And in order to really understand why this is so absurd that Israel would do this, we kind of have to understand a little bit about the history of Israel. So Israel, they were an entire nation in slavery in Egypt. And God, through a series of incredible miracles, like nothing that's ever been seen before, ever, God draws them out of Egypt and then on a miraculous journey from Egypt to the land where they're living, he, he protects them there and leads them through like a, a pillar of fire. He's like guiding them. And so it's like their, their whole existence is based on miracles provided by God. You know, you could say, you could say of anybody that they owe, their, they owe their whole existence to God. But God was very sure to make it really, really obvious to Israel. He's like, you know, it's not just that I created you. I've... I've gone out of my way to make sure you know that without me you would be totally screwed. And so then Israel, remember back our, our little map there, Israel's this little tiny desert country surrounded by just monstrous, gigantic, evil empires. I don't know if you know much about the ancient Near East, but I mean, you go from, I mean, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, just Egypt at the time, it's just, there's just so many huge, extremely powerful imperialistic forces surrounding Israel all the time, and God miraculously protects them in ways that makes it obvious that it was a miracle. He like tells them, he's like, no, I'll only go out with a few soldiers so you'll, you'll know it was me that won this battle, not you. So he, he makes it really clear, and he's like, but one thing, I want you to live for me. I want you, I want you as a nation to be a light for me where you are so that other people can know what I'm like. And so then what do they do? They turn around and carve idols out of wood and they bow down to them and worship them and they say, oh, our gods, we worship you. That's messed up. That is like adultery. That's worse than adultery. God gave them everything. He gave them his, their, their whole existence. And they're going to turn around and deny him for what? For gods that don't even exist. It's absurd that Israel would do this. I know that that might chafe against our... Uh, modern sensibilities, but it's really true. It is really absurd. 